Good evening, and welcome to Hershey Hall on the beautiful campus of Trine University. Tonight we have a special guest who has recently returned to the United States with a gold medal from the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, China. Loy Ball, a resident of Steuben County, attended school at Central Lutheran in New Haven, Indiana. Growing up, there was no high school boys volleyball in Indiana, so Ball only played in the summer. He made his first breakthrough at age 15 by getting an automatic position in the 1987 Olympic Festival. Following high school, Ball played for his father, Arnie, at IPFW from 1991 to 1995, during which the team advanced to three NCAA Final Fours. Since June of 1994, he has been a full-time member of the U.S. national team. He was named Best Server in the World in 1995 and Best Setter in the World in 1999. With the selection to the 2008 Olympic squad, Ball became the first male volleyball player from the United States to compete in four Olympics, 1996 in Atlanta, 2000 in Sydney, Australia, 2004 in Greece, Athens, and 2008 in Beijing, China. After leading Team USA past Russia in five sets in the 2008 Summer Olympic semifinals, Ball led Team USA to the gold medal by defeating world number one ranked Brazil in four sets. During the tournament, USA never lost a match, going undefeated at 8-0. Please help me in welcoming to USA Olympic gold medalist, Loy Ball. That takes care of about half my speech right there. <laughs> and uh, Thank you very much for that introduction. Usually I wait uh, a little bit for this part, but I, I feel it appropriate just to, to get it over with right now. Maybe I should have waited till the end. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'd lie. I'd be lying if, if, it did, if I didn't say it. it still gives me chills to put it around my neck. You know, it's, it's been almost three weeks now since uh, standing on that podium in Beijing, listening to the best song ever written with my right hand over my heart, singing as loudly and as badly as I possibly can, <clears throat> you know, our national anthem. To put into words what that felt like is, is impossible. I always made fun of athletes when I saw them on ESPN or in interviews and after winning a, a huge event and, and a huge moment in their lives, of course, some reporter would ask, how do you feel? Put in words how you're feeling. And of course, they would always have the stereotypical response, I, I can't find the words or I, I don't know what to say and sitting at home in my armchair, as I'm sure you, you all did. You thought, that's just silly. How can you have nothing to say? I mean, how can you not put it in words? Well, I can tell you <clears throat> now from experience, there are no words. Uh, there's overriding emotion, joy. There's contentment. There's resolve. Uh, there's sadness, in my case, knowing that it was the last time I'd wear uh, the red, white, and blue. There's just a feeling of overwhelming satisfaction that I hope and pray each and every one of you get to feel at some point in your life if you haven't already. Now I digress for a second. <clears throat> Playing volleyball in America is not an easy job, especially if you are a young man from rural Indiana. Growing up in the farm, I guess it's more of a ranch, wasn't it, Mom? Uh, a ranch out on Highway 24, uh, right before you get to the Ohio line, where I was uh, <clears throat> commanded to mow seven acres of grass repeatedly throughout my life and made to wash dishes by hand because Dad refused to buy a dishwasher when he had three born to him. <laughs> and where in the summers we had to detassel corn which is a thankless job, and hoe beans for grandpa, for quasi-free, I remind you. Not an easy place to become an Olympic volleyball player. But luckily, I had the support, I had the genetics, 
I guess you could say, even though looking at my father at five foot nine, you'd probably deny that, to strive to be a volleyball player. At age four, I remember my father and I sitting on our living room floor, I was Indian style, him on his knees, taking the cushions off the sofa, which my mom didn't like, and making them into a net. He blew up the balloon and tied it, and, and we started my volleyball career, hitting it back and forth in the living room over the, over the sofa, so, sofa cushions. I'm pretty sure at that point, he didn't think it would lead to a gold medal. He was just being a diligent father, playing with his firstborn, uh, keeping him entertained. As I grew, I remember in 84, sitting in front of our old zenith, the kind where you have to actually have to get up and go push the button or turn the knob, I can't remember, pretty sure black and white, watching the men's volleyball team win a gold medal, and Chris Marlowe, the backup setter, running around like a chicken without a head with the American flag over his head. And even at that young age, I looked at my dad and, and said, I think I'd like to do that. And then four years later, we sat at, I think, which was an upgraded TV at this point, um, and watched the 88 team win a gold medal. And then, old enough to know better, I turned to him and said, I know I want to do that. Now, luckily, some things happened. I started eighth grade. I was 5'8". I was, end of my freshman year, I was 6'6". Six, six. Now, obviously, that can't be predicted. And as my mom can attest to, finding jeans to fit me was somewhat of a, a tiresome ordeal. And having been able to wear your father's shoes in third grade, uh, people found somewhat comical, as you are right now. <laughs> but those beginning dreams and those beginning comments back in 84 and 88 started me on this journey that I guess I didn't realize at the time would lead me to, even I have to say, an incredible life to this moment. So I was playing basketball at high, at high school at Woodland because, as was mentioned before, there was no high school for, for boys. In the summer, my father was happy enough and proud enough to put a club together where a bunch of local kids who didn't play football got together in the fall and hit this little white ball around and went to tournaments where luckily there was, I think, 10 girls for every boy. So that was a big selling factor to get guys on the team. And we started every summer doing this. So during school year, basketball, summer, volleyball. Well, as I grew and become a little more coordinated, I found, I found out I was pretty decent at both sports. And then, of course, a choice had to be made, a choice that uh, some people in, uh, in Woodburn and Fort Wayne still think I made the incorrect one. But uh, to play for Coach Knight at IU or to play for this other pretty famous guy at IPFW who happened to be living in the same house as me. Well, after a bunch of deliberation, and after one night at the dinner table, my father actually saying to his only 6'8 son, I think you should play for Coach Knight. I slept on it, immediately next morning, had a press conference, and said I'm going to play for my father. Now, some people say just because I always did the opposite of my father, that's why I chose this. Not true. Not true. But I've always considered my father and my mother my role models. I've always considered my father probably the best coach, if not uh, in the nation, maybe the world, the most respected guy in my life, the guy who I aim to be, not only as a volleyball person, but as a father and a husband. And it just seemed like a logical choice, even at the age of 18, to play for him in Fort Wayne and try to help him and his program achieve something to that point which had not been achieved, and that's to go to the Final Four. Well, luckily it worked out and went to the Final Four my freshman year, which made me look real good. And I had a nice college career, and luckily we didn't kill each other. And we got out of there, and I went directly to the national team. And that's where this journey started for me. 14 years. I say this, this number a lot, <clears throat> especially in the last two weeks. 14 years. I joined the national team in 1994. I've been the starting setter ever since. And I can honestly tell you there must have been at least 14 times where I wanted to quit because it's hard. These ladies can test to it. It's hard. It's hard staying in shape. It's hard balancing school and sport. It's hard distractions, family and friends. As much as you love them, sometimes they're also a pain. You know what? It's hard. It's hard when you're sore and you can't get out of bed the next day. It's hard when you lose, then you lose again, and then you lose one more time. 
and I did a lot of losing. And I joke to people, you know, this, this Olympics, as was mentioned, I went 8-0, which is awesome, right? Well, the previous three Olympics, I didn't even win eight games. So three Olympics combined, zero, I mean, no, not eight wins. This Olympic, eight wins. So during this, during this journey, these 14 years, when I wanted to quit, luckily, I had surrounded myself with some amazing people, like I'm sure these students are doing right now, whether it be friends, or teammates, mothers, or fathers, wives, and now children who push you, who tell you it's okay. On those days when you want to quit, they say, sleep on it, and let's talk about it tomorrow. Because as we all know, the next day, it doesn't seem quite as bad. That when you think maybe you don't have any more to give, a teammate comes up and says, you know what, I'm going to help you through this. I know you're not your best today, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be better for you. When a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend helps you through those, that, that, tough, that tough loss, and you need someone to talk to, and they're, and they're there to listen to you and to help you through, that happened to me so many times those 14 years. And every time I started to wander off the pack, paths, luckily some family member pushed me back on. And it was my wife, as I got the call, two and a half years ago from the coach, Hugh McCutcheon. Lloyd, we'd like you to come back. Playing well, we need someone to solidify this team. And I said, well, I gotta talk to my wife, Sarah. It's a huge commitment. Uh, the sacrifice is enormous. You know, people only see the, the award ceremony. They only see Michael Phelps as he's touching the wall, celebrating that win. Here's, here's what you don't see. You don't see month after month away from your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your kids. You don't see six, seven, eight hours every day in the gym because you know someone younger and stronger is giving six, seven, eight hours in the gym. And if you don't put it in, you get knocked out. And being on top is pretty awesome, but it's hard as you know what to stay there. And it takes a lot of extra effort. And this sacrifice goes down and down. It goes down to the ones you leave behind. It goes down to, you know, going to these exotic places. People, as we went to the World League Finals in Rio, people are like, oh, Rio, you know, the Redeemer. And it's so beautiful. I was like, I didn't see it. <laughs> I saw a hotel, saw the bus, saw the gym, and I got back on the plane. Now, would I trade any of that to do something else? Absolutely not because the awards are fantastic, especially when you get to stand in front of you people wearing this thing. But it's not all great. There is sacrifice. And the reason I mention that is because, back to wanting to quit sometimes, the sacrifice gets enormous. And you wonder, as you'll wonder through your collegiate career, and then if you decide to play after college or in your professional career, or even, or even your parents in their professional careers, some days you just don't want to go back in because it's too hard. But luckily, you've surrounded yourself with these kind of individuals, these good friends, these good family, that'll help you get through those times and persevere. 14 years and perseverance. It's, it's why I get to stand here today. It's why I get to go all around the county, all around the state, all around this country, and kind of tell this little story. Because it wasn't easy, but the rewards were amazing. And it may not be a gold medal. It may be a promotion at work. It may just be another great day with your son or daughter. It may be another great uh, exam that you finish and do well on. But that perseverance and that work ethic and that sacrifice in the end, I think, pays off every time. OK, that's my kind of motivational speech right there. I hope you listen to it because I feel really strongly about it. I also want to share some things a little different. Let's talk about the Olympics. How many people actually stayed up that late? Be honest. No TiVos. I'm not talking TiVos and stuff. Okay, we got a couple. Okay, those kids are way too young to be staying up that late. I got to talk to your mom and dad afterwards. First of all, I appreciate that because I know, you know, they kind of gear everything, unfortunately, in our sports of the West Coast. So while they make, you know, Misty and, and, and Carrie and the beach girls and the beach boys and us inside, you know, nice at 9 p.m. for them, which means like midnight for here. So if you did stay up, greatly appreciate it. And hopefully you got your money's worth because we did pretty well. Um, but the Olympics, uh, this was by far the best Olympics I've been at. And like I said, uh, I've been to four. Uh, sadly enough to say Atlanta was probably like the worst and it should be the best being in America. 
but everyone was kind of talking a lot about this Olympics. I found that the buzz around this Beijing Olympics was the biggest buzz in, I guess, the 16 years I've been involved with the Olympic movement. And here's, I think, why. For one, China is a little interesting. You know, we don't, we don't know a lot about China except what we get on Fox News and CNN. And I can tell you, it's not real accurate all the time. We found, and I think my parents and my son will agree, the people to be unbelievably hospitable. And three months prior to the Olympics, the government put out millions of dollars trying to teach over 600,000 Chinese English in three months. I mean, I, I'm not even sure I could pass like an English test if I studied for three months. But, and these people, when we made contacts with them, whether they've been in restaurants or taxis, Okay, they're not speaking perfect English, but an unbelievable effort to try to converse with all, this for, a foreign, uh, all these foreign people in there taking advantage of their country. So that was interesting. Second of all, you know, they shipped out, <laughs> in a good way, I, I'm saying this, about half a million people just to kind of clear the area. You know, they asked people to go stay with friends and families in other provinces, um, just so it wasn't so overcrowded. Over, uh, uh, also, they made it so you couldn't drive your car. Let's say you have one, everyone only is allowed one car, obviously, but if your license plate number ended in an odd number, you could only drive it these certain days of the week. You know, to help cut down on smog, which was obviously a big problem before the Olympics, and just to leave lanes open for all the other Olympic travel as well as taxis. Also, this I found very interesting. The morning of the Olympic uh, opening ceremonies, the government in the air put off 11,000 rockets. Now, not fireworks, but rockets actually containing some kind of chemical that can keep rain away. Because rain was called for for opening ceremonies. So about 10 o'clock in the morning, you're seeing all these things going up in the air. And I was like, uh-oh, what did Bush do? <laughs> <laughs> but then we found out they were sending these up in the air to keep the rain away. Now, they didn't tell us exactly what's in them. And I don't think I grew like a third eye or anything, so I don't think it was too bad. But I can tell you one thing, it didn't rain that day. Now, unfortunately, the next day was like Hurricane Katrina. I mean, it was raining and we had water everywhere. So obviously it was only a 24-hour rocket, I guess. But they spent, I, I heard, like $30 million on these rockets to, uh, to keep the rain away for opening ceremonies and then use them again on the last day for the marathon and the closing ceremonies. So I was thinking maybe we'd get around with local farmers and kind of get our hands on some of those rockets. You know, I know we can make it rain, and now we can make it stop. Could be a good thing. Also, the food. I mean, I have listened to every interview on Mike and Mike in the morning with the Dream Team guys. I think Carmelo Anthony was on the other day. He was talking, and um, you know, they asked him, how was the food over there? Well, we only ate McDonald's. And I listened to Michael Phelps. Well, how was the I only ate McDonald's. Don't eat McDonald's, OK? This doesn't guarantee you a gold medal, all right? Just because those guys won one, don't eat it. But it's funny because the food was actually very good. I mean, we had, we had a mess hall. I'm going to say double the size of this gym, where at any given point, there was five to 6,000 athletes. And they had it separated off where you got your Mexican section, food section, Mexican <laughs> section, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you got your you know, uh, Mediterranean, you got your fish, you got your vegetarian, you got your Chinese or Asian, and then, like a huge beacon of light, at the end of this mess hall are 50 Chinese people in red McDonald outfits. <laughs> and like, a, like homing pigeons, you'd see the athletes, okay, first couple days, they're kind of looking, and okay, I get my steak and potatoes, and next day, a little closer, pasta bar, and by the third day, the lines were just enormous. I mean, between Abe McMuffins in the, in the morning and Big Macs at night, I'm not sure how Hussein Bolt ran that fast because he was there every day. <laughs> I kid you not. So that's kind of a, and, and inside this Olympic village, I know they talk about it a lot, but it's basically like uh, a sandals, like an all-exclusive resort, but like without ocean or beach or nice rooms or air conditioned sometimes, uh, and with beds for five foot tall people. <laughs> no, it's not that bad, actually. Uh, every country, uh, and luckily you know where you go because they put these huge flags on every building. Otherwise, because all the buildings look alike, otherwise you'd have 60, you know, 6,000 people who don't speak the same language just wandering around this village, which happens to have 
not to scare you, but like three layers of barbed wire around it. Um, there was never any problems as far as the athletes go, but as precautions, of course, there's gates everywhere and you have to have a badge. And if you put your badge up and it's not your face, you get the beat down pretty much. But uh, <laughs> nothing like that happened. But these buildings have these uh, two apartments, six guys or six girls each apartment. Uh, they have uh, spas in there where if you want to get your nails did or your hair cut or I don't know, foot massage or whatever you think you need because in reality, the, the Olympics, for the 6,000 or so athletes that are there, about 500 of them are serious. And, and it's not to demean the rest of them, it's just the reality of it. You know, that's why I was saying before when I, when I was talking to some folks, they asked, well, you know, did you take, how was the Olympics? How was the, how was the environment? How was the experience? I don't know. I left the village twice for an hour each time just to say hello to my, to my family. Because if you go there and you re realistically have a chance to win, you're not a spectator. You're not going to get to enjoy it. Uh, you're not going to go see the 100 meter relays. You're not going to see the dream team play. You're going to be rehabbing, in my case, a very old body or watching video preparing for your next game or resting or practicing or playing. And there's about 500 of those athletes that when they go there, Michael Phelps type, um, the dream team guys, who basically go there for one reason, that's to compete. So while that's great, and obviously wearing this is why we go, it's also, once again, not exactly the, 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 the pony show that, that you see on TV. And we don't, we don't get to take in the whole, the whole vibe of the Olympics. But, but coming away with this is obviously makes that sacrifice worth it. Um, also, in China, you can ask my son up there, uh, they went down to the market one afternoon. Yeah? And uh, tell, tell them what you ate, Dyer. Scorpions and seahorses. Yeah. So here I am in the village and I get this text. I open my phone and there's a picture of my son with a stick with some kind of meat on it. So I text him back, I'm like, what, what, what do you got there? Some kind of pork, some kind of fish or something? And he texts back and he's like, uh, no, that is a seahorse. <laughs> right. So then I get another one about 10 minutes later, and he's got this picture of his face with this thing sticking out the side of his mouth. And I finally I call my wife, I'm like, what are you guys doing? Says, oh, the diary and your dad want to try some seahorses, I mean some scorpions. And I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, he's going to be sick for days. I mean, but Dyer and my family definitely got to enjoy the experience of the Olympics. Between eating all the crazy food and walking on the Great Wall and uh, going to forbidding cities, I mean, that's what the Olympics is about when your family can enjoy that. Then, of course, come and cheer dad and son and husband on to a gold medal. Uh, I think they had a, a very nice time, to say the least. You know, in conclusion, and then I'd like to open up some questions. Um, like I said at the beginning, to put into words how I feel. Going back to my initial statement of standing on that podium, I made a promise to my grandma Vivian back in 1990. Uh, my grandfather, my dad's father, uh, served in D-Day. One of the few guys to, to make, it up, uh, make it up that hill. Just, recent, just passed away about two years ago now. And our family has a, a long history, as I'm sure many of you do, of, of military service. My brother-in-law actually has finished a second tour in Iraq not so long ago. You know, a lot of us don't do that for a lot of reasons. You know, we don't sign up or we're not called to it. And, and obviously nowhere near as dangerous. Um, but for me to be able to do my part as a patriot, as someone who believes very strongly in this country we live in, uh, for me to be able to wear the three most beautiful letters on my jersey, which is USA, and represent my country, I feel very strongly about. And I hope as a community and as individuals, you know, you feel strong about it too. So I promised Grandma Viv that I would sing the national anthem every time I heard it and every time I played. And since that day I have. And uh, I didn't know I was singing it quite so loud, I guess, <laughs> the last one, but you can say I guess the emotion uh, caught up with me. But uh, I leave you with this, and, and, I, and, I, and I talk to the little kids a lot about it in elementary schools because I think it's, it's something important and something that gets lost a little bit, that I have been everywhere on this planet. I have had filled five passports. 
I have played in every continent. Uh, I've met someone who spoke every language. And I can tell you, looking directly at each and every one of you, we live in the best country in the world. Yeah. And if you ever start to doubt that, go visit Cuba. Go, go visit Argentina. Go visit parts of China. Just take a trip and you realize how blessed we are as communities, as a government, you know, all, all, the, all the, and obviously this is an interesting time with government, with the, the election coming up, and, and for all the debacles that people like to talk about, at least we have a system in place that we, everyone gets a fair shake. Everyone gets a voice, because I can tell you, and I just came from one place that's like this, it doesn't work like that everywhere. So be happy, be proud that you have wonderful homes, wonderful families, wonderful educations, wonderful opportunities for young ladies to play sports and get an education, because that doesn't happen everywhere. Just be thankful that we live in such a wonderful place, because I know I am, and that's why I'm so proud to share this, this gold medal with all of you today here at Trine University. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions? I, I'll, I'll take, uh, let me get a couple out of the way real quick because I know the young kids will ask this right away. 6'8", 235, size 16. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Actually, uh, I leave Tuesday and go to Russia. Uh, I have played the last 12 years overseas. I uh, played three years Japan, four years Italy, two years Greece. This will be my third year in Russia. Uh, I play for a team in Kazan, which is 600 kilometers, you convert it, I can't, uh, east of Moscow on the Volga River. Uh, we were reigning Russian champions and European Cup champions last year. Uh, I play with a, a fellow teammate, Clay Stanley, our big opposite, and then 10 Russian guys. And uh, I will be there for about six months going back and forth with my family. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the great things is winning a gold medal. One, one of the not so great things, don't get paid so well. So uh, we, we all play professionally overseas uh, to make our livings. Yeah. Excellent question. Oh, it was a romantic evening in New Haven, Indiana. <laughs> and uh, actually, yeah, I met her. Uh, she was a freshman at IPFW. I was a sophomore. I uh, met her at a bonfire. Next day, one of my friends was going to ask her out, kind of pushed him out of the way and asked her first. And um, he forgave me. And uh, I've been together ever since. I've been together 15 years, married 11 years Saturday in two days. This is our anniversary. Yeah, if you see her, make sure you tell her I remembered that. Okay. And, uh, you know, I mentioned before about sacrifice. No one has sacrificed more than she has. I mean, not only to, to, to follow me around the world, you know, for 11 years, uh, but then sometimes it seemed like a single mom when I'm away, taking care of our two beautiful children, and um, to always support me. She was the one that pushed me to play in this Olympics, uh, stating the obvious where they will not be calling me for London, probably, um, and just saying that wouldn't it be great uh, to go and, and have your son be at the Olympics and watch you play and maybe win. And as usual, she was smarter than I was, and it worked out just like that. <laughs> Yeah. I appreciate that. Thanks. You know, Obviously, as I mentioned before, I didn't get the height gene from my dad, but I did get the, the, the gene of not being afraid to speak in front of people. Uh, I love, uh, you know, one of the best parts about my job is not just to travel around the world, but to meet so many people and to be able to interact in so many different cultures. And if you're at all shy about that, you know, it inhibits you, I think. And I've always been one that uh, try to get the most out of every experience. And it's just been an, uh, an unbelievable uh, adventure, I guess to say, these last 14, 15 years. 
and um, it's, it's, I'm just happy to share it. You know, people always talk about, you know, the don't touch the gold medal and, and uh, you know, being a little protective of, as an athlete a lot of times. I, I just don't feel that way, you know. I, I would have to say there's probably been 10,000 people touch, hold, put the medal around their neck. I, I feel, truly feel that this medal belongs not just to me, but to my family, to my friends, to the Fort Wayne community, to Northeast Indiana, to my new home up here in Angola. You know, some people will never see or touch a gold medal. I mean, I almost didn't. And I worked at it for 14 years. So, in order, so to be able to, to share a little bit with them and to hopefully, I don't know, give them a little inspiration in whatever they do, I feel is not my duty, but my pleasure. Yeah. The biggest difference, our average age this Olympics was 31, which may seem old, but with, with USA Volleyball, we get a late start. Everyone else in the world starts to play professional volleyball at about 17 or 18. Well, because we have universities here, which are a good thing, <laughs> but our kids, when they get out, we get out at 22, still not prepared to play at international volleyball level, where the rest of the world is by 22 in their prime. So what happens to our players is they really don't reach their prime till 28, 29, in my case, 36. Uh, <laughs> I was a late bloomer. So we're a little bit behind, and I think just the culmination of athleticism we had in the team, not yet declining, but yet our experience and maturity on a rise was just a perfect timing. And, uh, you know, a lot of times you can have all the talent in the world. I mean, I've been on the team in 2000, much more talented. Team in 96, much more talented. But it just didn't have the right mix. And I'm sure you guys can attest to this. You've all been on teams where you can have the, the right talent, but if, if the team doesn't have the chemistry, the communication, the, the ability to go on the same path, even through diversity, it's pretty difficult to win. And luckily that all came, well, not just luckily, I think through hard work and effort, that all came to fruition this Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, these last two years have been, have been brutal. And uh, once I decided to come back to the national team, I got back from Russia two years ago, uh, mid-May, had about 10 days here with my family, and then had to go directly out to Anaheim, where the USA national team trains. One of the unfortunate things, you know, I, I've been pretty adamant about not leaving Indiana, which some people on my team don't quite understand. Uh, but then when I show them my mortgage compared to their mortgage, they kind of get the idea. Um, <laughs> But I've been real adamant about staying here in Northeast Indiana for a lot of reasons. One, my wife and I are from here. My parents remain here. Her parents and sisters still live here. All my high school, college friends are here. Not a better place in the world to, to raise a family. Um, it's, just, it's just where I want to be. So having made that decision made it difficult because the team's in Anaheim. And everyone except me lives in Southern California. So they drive to practice and then go home when I drive to practice in, in my rental car and then drive to a crummy apartment and sit by myself because there's no TV. Uh, luckily this year, we, we kind of dipped our hand in the, uh, in the piggy bank a little and, and rented a house so my family could come out for part of the summer while I was training. Um, but it's just another example of the sacrifice that we kind of had to go through in order to make this commitment. Because we train in Anaheim, we train about six hours a day uh, when we're not traveling and playing all, all over the world. And, uh, it was, a little, it was a little difficult to do sometimes, but uh, luckily we made it through, it paid off, and now I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, uh-oh. Well, coaching. Uh, you know, I know there's a gentleman down south, about 45 minutes, who's, who's getting up there in age, and uh, Maybe I, I get that job someday when it opens up. But, you know, I, I know a lot of times players kind of transition into coaching. I'm not sure one I'd be a good one uh, because if you ask my children to agree, patience is not one of my best virtues. And I know you need to be real patient, don't you, coach? Yeah. Uh, hopefully, as I continue to mature, that becomes a part of my repertoire. But I, I for sure want to, once I decide to stop playing, want to take two or three years uh, and just be full-time dad, full-time husband. And, uh, and then after that, evaluate what I want to do. Coaching is always a possibility. I mean, I love the game. I love sports too much, probably not to be involved in it somehow. 
but uh, after 15, 16 years of playing and being around volleyball, it'll be nice just to drive the kids to school and help with math for a while. Yeah. All right, I want to thank you all very much for coming out here and inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I hope to see you all around town. Uh, I won't be a stranger. I'm one of you now. I'm not sure what we call ourselves, Angolians or, or, or Hornets, I guess, I guess. But uh, thank you once again, all right? Oh, if you want pictures of the medal or with me, I'd be more than happy. Or if you got something to sign, I'd be more than happy to do it. Lewis. I thought it was a great speech. He talked about some of his experiences he's gone through the year and how tough it is to try to reach your goals. Uh, he, wait, he was on the USA Volleyball for 16 years and he toughed it out. He went through a lot of adversity and he got what he, he came to do and that was to get a gold medal. Yes, I had uh, a chance to play with Loy in uh, high school uh, on his club team his father had, had ran. I played with him for two years. Um, we won one Junior Olympic National Championship. Uh, Loy, of course, was our setter. I only played back row because unfortunately I'm only six foot tall. <laughs> but it was a great experience. Loy was a great player. He was uh, definitely the leader of our team. He always got us fired up for all our matches. Um, it's great to watch him over the years grow as a player and as and to become to what he has today. Because I was the only one who had good hands. No, uh, you know I was started out as an attacker uh, because of my height, but uh, because we were kind of limited in numbers and back then we ran a six-two uh, with two setters. Uh, there was only two of us who could really set, and I kind of developed from there. Dad. Uh, my dad, Arnie Ball, realized I had pretty soft hands and understood the game. Uh, and I enjoyed setting, uh, kind of being the quarterback on the team. So I just kind of uh, progressed and stayed in that role. You know, I had a goatee going in, then we won, and then we won again, and then I just decided to roll with it, a little superstitious, you know, wore the same socks all eight matches, washed them, of course, but same, uh, you know, same spandex, same everything, so I figured I might as well not shave, I mean, it was working. I think the biggest, the biggest match, as far as nerves concerned, was the Serbia match, I mean, Losing in a quarterfinal, you're done. I mean, there's no way to come back. There's no way to play for a medal. I think that's the most pressure match. Once you get past that match, it's not all gravy, but you have a legitimate chance of winning a gold medal. And we felt real good against Russia, even though we hadn't played against them. And then getting to the final, I mean, we're the only team in the last two years who's had Brazil's number. We beat them four times in the last year and a half. So I think they were more worried, and I thought you saw that in the way they played in their eyes than we were. We were practicing the day before we played Venezuela. Uh, someone came into the, the, the practice, notified coach of what had happened with the attack. He ran out immediately. We were notified after practice what had happened and obviously just devastated. Uh, right away got a hold of our family and friends, let them know they'd be coming across the wire obviously pretty soon and letting them know that we were all okay. And then the team just kind of you know, got around Hugh and, and the staff and each other and, and you know, even though it's such a horrific thing, you know, guys have been working their whole life for this. And uh, we weren't going to let uh, the acts of a very foolish man uh, ruin the dreams of ours. So while we kept Hugh and his family in our thoughts and our hearts and our prayers, we knew it would do a huge disservice to him if we didn't go out and play the best we could. So we just played well, played hard, played for ourselves, played for our country, and played for him and his family. Hey, this is Lloyd Ball, your local gold medal winner, and you're watching 101 Lakes Network. <laughs>